Hey Harvest, did you ever think how awesome it would be to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus like Nicodemus who came to him by night in John chapter 3 or the woman at the well who poured out her heart to Jesus in John chapter 4? No doubt about it, the most powerful conversations we have, I have, you have, are one-on-one -on -one conversations. So wouldn't it be awesome to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus? Well, that's the title of the message this weekend, One-on-One -on -one with Jesus, and it's the final message in our Psalm 11.3 series. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And this time we wanna talk about the foundation of Jesus Christ. That's why I kind of changed the message to this weekend because I knew I'd be in a place, this is a very personal place for me. I'm up at Camp Harvest and this is where I do my reflecting. Uh, this is a place that the Lord has met me many times and I thought it'd be a great setting for a one-on-one -on -one conversation uh, between you and me. Now, someday you're going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Jesus. So let's think about this as a one-on-one -on -one between you and me to get ready for the big one-on-one -on -one, uh, that's coming for all of us. Let's take a minute and pray together. Father, I pray as we look into your word that you would meet with us. I pray that regardless of what we've brought into church today, that we could set that momentary, fleeting, passing, um, heavy burden aside and pick up instead something ultimate, something eternal, something impending, something ultimate, uh, something guaranteed that's coming for each one of us. Uh, let today be uh, a life-changing preparation for our one-on-one -on -one with you, scheduled certainly sometime in the future. So use your word to those ends, we pray now in Jesus' name, amen. All right, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, normally I'm up in front of the whole church just preaching up a storm, right? And uh, everyone's listening to me as a group. And my heart uh, now is, is that um, you'd have a lot less sense of being in a room full of people and a lot more of a sense of you and I talking personally over coffee. Let's get real about the one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3 uh, raises the subject and uh, the context of 1 Corinthians 3 is a division in the church. Uh, people had preferences for their own kind of celebrity preacher. He says, some were of Paul, some were of Apollos. He says, who, who are either one of them? God is the one uh, who causes the harvest. And then he changes the analogy from one planting, uh, one watering, God causing the growth. He changes it from a farming analogy to a building analogy and uh, I'm going to pick it up in verse 10 1 Corinthians 3 10 are you there according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder I laid a foundation uh, there's our word uh, it's the word uh, themelios uh, from which uh, we get this idea of a, uh, a laid structure upon which a solid building uh, can be raised. Like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds. That's the message. Here it is, verse 11. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive award, a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So um, four times uh, in that passage, the word foundation is used. And this passage is about the judgment seat of Christ. And I want to just give you some facts about the judgment seat of Christ, just sort of to uh, get us going here before we're going to walk through the passage and then seek to apply it to each of our lives. All right. Um, five facts about the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, number one, uh, the meaning uh, of the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the Greek word is bima. And it was a, a raised place, some mounted steps. I've actually been uh, to the city of Corinth and seen uh, the Bema seat, it was called. It was the official seat of the judge. Uh, it looked kind of like a throne. And uh, in Greek times, it was the platform where after a race, an actual reward 
uh, would be given. It was never used as a bench of punishment. It was a, a, a place uh, where the judges think about the Olympics, no punishment just because you didn't get the gold, all right? It was uh, an athletic competition place of assessment where rewards were handed out uh, for those who had competed successfully. So the meaning and then uh, the time, um, just track with me on this. I know some of you like these technical things better than others, but uh, the time of the judgment seat of Christ is after the rapture. Uh, here's how we know. Luke 14, 14 says, and you will be blessed for they cannot repay you for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So the reward that God has in store for us is coming at this thing called the resurrection. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 says that someday the skies are going to break open, the Lord, a trumpet will sound, the Lord himself will descend uh, with the voice uh, of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. It says the dead in Christ will be raised first, then we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. I'm quoting there from 1 Thessalonians 4. So, um, the resurrection, we will be raised, the dead in Christ will be raised first, then we who are alive and remain will also be raised up. So, the raising happens at the resurrection. The reward happens at the resurrection. So, we know that the rapture at the raising the resurrection and the reward, put all that together. When Jesus Christ returns, we will be raptured, resurrected, and rewarded. The judgment seat of Christ follows immediately after the rapture. So, back to our facts. The meaning, uh, the time, the judge. Uh, the judge will be Christ. Uh, John 5, 22 says, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. So even though this um, is a, an assessment for reward, um, the one doing that assessment, we've all seen the crazy things that happen in the Olympics, and uh, boy, that didn't seem like a good score. I thought she was a lot better than that. There won't be any of that. Jesus Christ himself alone will assess and give the rewards to his children. Now, um, the subjects uh, will be believers. All right, only believers at the judgment seat of Christ, only those who have turned from their sin and embraced Jesus by faith for their forgiveness will be at the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14.10 says, Why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we will all appear uh, before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, so you're going to be there, I'm going to be there. I'm like, I'm not sure if I'm going to go. You're going if you're one of his children. And your one-on-one, -on -one, my one-on-one, -on -one, that's going to be something, isn't it? The meaning, the time, the judge, the subjects, and then the basis uh, is going to be examination of your life after the cross. All right? This is not about salvation. Uh, believers are delivered from all judgment. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, John 5, uh, 24 says, mm -hmm. He who um, loves uh, my, who, he who hears my words and believes on him who sent me, uh, will not pass into condemnation, but has, has gone from death to life. So there's, isn't this great news? Um, through faith in Jesus, there's, you will never be condemned. So when you think of the judgment seat of Christ, there's no condemnation. There's no, why did you? There's more like, look what I gave you, and what did you do with it? It's, it's uh, think of rewards uh, when you think of, the judgment seat of Christ. So there's some specifics. Now let's go through the passage, and I just want to share three things uh, here with you. First of all, in life, uh, we construct the building, okay? So the analogy is, is that your life as a follower of Jesus is like you're building a building. And that's why he says, uh, based on this foundation, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So lots of faiths, lots of religions, uh, sadly lots of Christians have tried to build their life, their ministry on something other than Jesus Christ. There's only one foundation, that's Jesus Christ, and I trust that you are building your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Now if you are not all building on the foundation of Jesus Christ is actually um, even going to receive a reward, and that's what this passage is about. Uh, 
No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation, and here they come, a six building materials, three valuable, three non-valuable, uh, three uh, um, non-combustible, three combustible. There's going to be a fire that's going to test our building, test our work. And uh, if you've built with gold, gold, silver, see it there, precious stones. Now those are not, man, I, I, hope, I'm, I hope I'm silver. I, I don't think I'm gold. I, maybe I'm precious stones. They're, they're not in descending order. Uh, actually, um, today, uh, an ounce of gold is worth what? You know, 1,200 bucks or something? Less than, uh, more than 1,000, less than two for sure. Um, um, an ounce of diamonds is worth a couple of hundred thousand. It's, it's not like that. It's valuable things, not valuable things. The gold, silver, precious stones are small, beautiful, hard to obtain, require more work, um, are going to lead to a reward. The wood, um, think of a building built of wood, maybe what, the door, the frames, and then the hay, that would be mixed with mud for the walls, uh, the stubble, uh, that's worse. That's the part that's left in the field after harvest. It's the, the, the stalks, the, and that's formed into some kind of a thatched roof. Uh, imagine the flame, the fire. The Bible says that fire goes out of the eyes of Jesus Christ. And um, imagine the flame of Christ testing uh, our work with those combustible materials. So these materials are not gifts. Uh, these materials are the work that we have done. And works, uh, make a note of this, works are not the source of life in Christ, but they are the sign of life in Christ. The true Christians are working for him. Ephesians chapter 2 says, by grace you save through faith. It's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. It's not of works, can't be saved by works, so that no one can boast. But then it goes right on to say in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we are his workmanship and we are created for good works. So Christians aren't saved by works, but they are a sign of true salvation. Now I think three areas sort of determine uh, here the kinds of materials uh, that you're using because you should be asking now, man, that one-on-one -on -one for me with Jesus is coming up and James is having a one-on-one -on -one with me to get me ready for the other one-on-one, -on -one. correct. The foundation is Christ and then what you're building. Are you building with gold and silver and precious stones? I think uh, the answer is um, what service are you doing? Here we go into another ministry year. Some of you haven't given a thought to how you're gonna serve the Lord in this ministry year. Some of you have not been serving for years. Others of you have served for a while and you got discouraged, you got hurt, someone didn't thank you, but you know, it's not time for our thanks yet. I love the story years ago, I can't remember the details of it, but it's a man who had been a missionary for many years in the mission field and he was coming home after 40 or 45 years in the mission field. He'd sacrificed everything to reach lost people in some very dark place. And as things would have it, he was coming in on a boat uh, just about the time the president, uh, Roosevelt, who was famous uh, for his uh, safaris, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was returning from Africa and this missionary was on the same boat and as he came into the harbor there was, uh, you know, ticker tape and celebration and, but it wasn't for him, even though he'd spent his whole life over there, it was just for a man who'd been there for a few days. And he was kind of dejected, you know, I'm home, I, I gave my life for this and someone said to him, you're not home yet. And uh, that's the point, isn't it? And why do we anticipate the reward for service uh, when we haven't yet even appeared for, by the one uh, before the one who called us into his service. So, are you serving? Um, why do you do it? Do you do it for thanks? Do you do it for appreciation? Do you do it for recognition? These are important questions to be asking if you want to build on the foundation of Jesus with gold, silver, and precious stone, which will pass the test, and not with wood, hay, and stubble, which will be consumed. Uh, what do we do? Are we serving? Uh, why do we do it? Our motives? Uh, how do we do it? Do we do it joyfully? Do we do it, you show up for children's ministry, you serve in the parking lot, you're still leading a small group, but are you doing it joyfully as unto the Lord? I said to one of my sons as I prepared to give this message, I am so happy to be doing this. And I have to say that I haven't 
always, every time, felt like that. But I'm just so reminded of the importance of God sees my heart and he knows if this is an act of love to him and an act of love for the people that I'm blessed to serve. And uh, so let's look into our hearts. Are we serving? Um, um, why are we serving? Uh, what do we expect to get from it? And how we do it joyfully, faithfully, uh, fervently. Um, a little gold uh, is inconspicuous but precious. It's worth more than a warehouse full of hay. And some people, Jesus said, the last will be first. Some people have done so much for the Lord, but for wrong reasons and with a wrong heart. And uh, so let's make sure not just that we're serving the Lord passionately, but that we're doing it uh, with the right materials. Now, uh, in life we construct the building, then uh, in eternity, Christ examines the building. So let's all look at verse 13. We're past the materials now. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So there we are, I don't know, it's this massive throng of raptured uh, saints uh, all together from all time before the Lord. And will we see each other? I'm not sure. Um, will there be a line? Who's going first? You can go first. I mean, that's gonna be pretty um, intimidating, right? And, uh, but immediately after the rapture comes this bima, and I want to point out a couple of things to you. Notice that the building is unseen until the judgment seat of Christ. No one knows what your building is. Don't think about Pastor Rick's building. Don't think about your spouse's building. Don't think about your, what your parents built. Um, no one knows. And, and we're to search our hearts. God has withheld this from us to produce reflection in us at a time just like this. I've brought you to the place where I do a ton of reflecting. Someone has said that the unexamined life uh, is not worth living. And uh, so how do you feel about looking inside right now, like into a mirror? What am I doing for the Lord? He's given everything for me. And not just what am I doing, because some are doing much, but why am I doing it? What am I building with? So notice that the building is unseen until the judgment seat of Christ. You know, one of the hardest things for me in being a pastor has been uh, the fact that um, my life is so public. I mean, what I see, I've been in the same church for so long, every mistake I've ever made, I'm now twice as old, can you believe it, as when Kathy and I started uh, this church. And uh, boy, I can see why pastors wanna go to a different state and start over. But I've always believed that while that would be easier, it wouldn't be better. And just my reality of having so much so public, um, maybe that can call to mind for you the fact that someday, it's all going to be public. Do you see what it says there? That each one's work will become manifest. The day will disclose it or even declare it, one translation says, that what has been in secret is going to be shouted. Everyone will know what you and I have done. Everyone will know why we did it. And uh, that is a sobering reality that should affect us today. So in eternity, Christ examines the building and then... Um, Notice this, notice that all will be seen. Um, each one's work will become manifest. The fire will test it. it there's not parts that, well, I'm not as proud of that. I'd like to just, can we have that left out? So there's no line item veto for us. You can't cross off your worst year, your worst month, your worst day. It's, it's all that we have done for the Lord. Not our sins. We're not talking about, about the things that are forgiven that there's no condemnation. This isn't about our sins. Um, this is about our work, our ministry. And notice, what, is, what does that make you feel like though? That all of that work is gonna be seen. It reminded me of an amazing uh, thing that happened this week that brought to mind something uh, 27 years ago that I'm not proud of. And when the church had first started, I'm telling you, this is like in the first two or three weeks of the church, I was driving on 53 in uh, um, my car and it was a leased car, and uh, it was pouring rain. You know, like when should I pull over? It's pouring rain. And someone pulled over in front of me, and the right rear of their car clipped the left front of my car. And they didn't stop. And I didn't have the money to fix my leased car, and there's a big ding in the fender, and I took off after the person and kind of tried to signal for them to pour over, and the rain's pouring down, and they wouldn't pull over. And they, I rolled down my window, and they rolled down their window, and there was a little bit of shouting. Um, he wouldn't pull over. And uh, 
I made a rude gesture. I'm not proud of it. And I did get his license plate. Um, so I went to his door. I found his name, found his address, went to his door and knocked on it. He opened the door. I said, you're so-and-so and, -so, and uh, I'm the person that, you know, um, and I kind of described what had happened. And he said, and you're Pastor James. Uh. And so immediately he brought up um, my uh, gesture and I always felt so badly, especially when I found out he was a Christian and I knew I'd really let him down and I was so afraid for the truth to come out. I just was so afraid for the truth to come out of this foolish um, response to a tough situation. And so anyway, um, so this past week, wouldn't you know it, Kathy and I are out for breakfast uh, last Monday. We're sitting in a restaurant and she says, do you see who that is over there? It was him. And I had uh, an opportunity to uh, call him over and I'd seen him maybe once or twice through the years, but never really talked. And I said, you know, it's a long time ago now, but uh, you know, I don't know if you remember, but I kind of, and I feel so sorry for how I was that he, he just stopped me. And he, he just said to me, he said, uh, we're both different people than we were back then. And I thought, <laughs> so much grace. We talked about where he's going to church now. And it was just an awesome, awesome moment to remind me how badly I want to make sure that, and I thank the Lord for that opportunity. Everything in my life, I want to make sure that it's prop. Because you know what? Otherwise, um, as it relates to my work for the Lord, it's going to come up uh, again. Isn't it good to get things handled, get things resolved, get where we need to be? I thank you for the grace that he gave me. And God wants to give you grace in regard to the work you're not doing, the work you are doing for him for wrong reasons, with a wrong attitude. And uh, so let's go a little further in the passage. Notice the building is unseen. Notice that all will be seen. Notice that a little word, uh, sort, the fire will test uh, every man's work of what sort it is. Circle that in your Bible there. Um, what sort of work are you doing? That's such a powerful question, isn't it? What sort of life are you living? What sort of family are you raising? What sort of marriage are you? These are all the works for the Lord. What sort of um, business are you running for the Lord? What sort of him? employee are you there as a testimony for the Lord? What sort of work are you doing for the Lord? The fire will test every man's work of what sort it is. And then finally notice every, every single Christ follower will be there. Every single Christ follower will have their work tested. I find that super compelling. You might notice I have a bracelet on here. Um, some of you know that in 2009, I found out that I had prostate cancer, and uh, well, that's a game changer. Talk about face to face with your mortality, and the Lord was gracious to me, and it was caught early. Men, make sure you're getting your PSA exams, especially as you get into your mid-40s. And uh, I'm thankful that the Lord uh, directed me to get that tested. It'd be a very different day today in my mid-50s if I hadn't got that discovered in my late 40s. And But still now, um, past six years, six and a half years, I have to go every few months and I have to have a test. And last week after church on Monday morning, I went to the hospital um, and uh, I got the blood test and then you wait several hours to find out. And I'm just telling you every time still, what if it's gone up? What if it's come back? What if it's gone up? I'm not going to be here forever. I thank the Lord for the sanctifying influence of that illness upon my life to give to me in every moment the sense life is short eternity is long that's why it says take care how you're building um, be thoughtful about the coming one-on-one -on -one with jesus and to be reminded uh, of the reality of what's coming toward us so uh, in life uh, you're constructing a building in eternity christ examines the building and uh, here's uh, the last thing. Uh, in eternity, Christ uh, rewards uh, the builder. Isn't that fantastic? In eternity, Christ rewards the builder. Now, notice that there's uh, kind of two kinds of Christians. There's Christians that are working for the Lord for right reasons, 
with the right attitude and doing it faithfully and there's people that aren't working or aren't working for the right reasons for the Lord or are working and are working for the right reasons but they got kind of a bad attitude about it and uh, so there's two kinds uh, of workers and uh, let me uh, encourage uh, the faithful and we had a great leadership night here a week ago and the Rolling Meadows Auditorium was filled with faithful faithful people in our church I don't know their hearts only God can see uh, their building uh, but uh, I'm so thankful for the faithful, hardworking, dedicated servants that make up Harvest, Harvest Bible Chapel. And I know that they're taking to their heart right now. Boy, I got to make sure I'm doing it faithfully, doing it for the right reasons, doing it with a good attitude. And then um, there are people uh, in our church who uh, know Jesus, love Jesus, worship Jesus, but don't work for Christ. You're not working for Christ. What does a disciple do? They worship Christ, walk with Christ, and work for Christ. And uh, the Bible says, work for the night is coming when no man can work. And uh, whether your building is uh, wrongly motivated or with a bad attitude, or whether you really don't have anything except the foundation itself, someday that is going to be tested. And notice in regard to the, not the faithful workman, but the worthless workman, notice the element of surprise. You're going to be standing there and, and here comes the torch to your building and some people are going to be like Whew, and like a piece of marble it'll still be there. And other people it's going to be Whew. you know what it is when a flame goes up on something super flammable and Christ himself will apply the torch to the building that you've built. But isn't it good to know it's not too late to build and to build for right reasons with the right attitude? And notice the element of surprise. Notice that it will result in loss. It says, and if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he'll receive a reward. That's for a separate message, but Christ is going to reward the faithful workers. And if anyone's work is burned up, it's like, well, what happens then? Does that mean you lose your salvation? No. See here, he will suffer loss, the loss of reward, though he himself will be saved. I remember my pastor growing up used to say, saved by the skin of his teeth, barely made it into heaven. Nothing built on the foundation. He will be saved, but only as through fire. Just made it into heaven. Now there's still time. Isn't this a great day today? This is uh, Labor Day weekend. And, uh, but instead of thinking about our careers, we're thinking about our work for the Lord. And I'm challenging you to think about the one-on-one -on -one that's coming between you and Jesus. And I'm challenging you to think about making the best use of your life uh, for the Lord. Not just to work for the Lord, but to work for the Lord for the right reasons and uh, to do it uh, with the right attitude. Knowing that God sees your work. I love what it says in Hebrews that God is not so unjust as to forget your labor of love in having and in ministering to the saints as you do. And may that be said of each one of us. Now, I have one more thing uh, that I want to show you. So uh, let's freeze it right here, and I'm going to pick it up in a second. You're going to really be blessed by this. Well, here's my surprise. Uh, I have a dog, and my dog, and uh, his name is Jack. You can see that he has a Cubs tag, which we're very, very happy about. And, and uh, so he's a big Cubs fan. And, uh, you know, Abby had a dog while she was growing up, but I've never had my own dog. And I always wanted to have my own dog. The older I get, the more I think about what are the things that I wanted to get done in my life. And, you know, a lot more important than a pet, even though I'm enjoying him, are the things that we've always wanted to do for the Lord. What are the things that you've always wanted to do for the Lord, uh, but never did? I'm over uh, now near the lodge at Camp Harvest. And I'm gonna show you something that I don't think anyone has ever really talked about in public before. Long before this was Camp Harvest, this property was owned by a man named Bob Van Campen. And while his family gave us the camp, and they have all become very dear to us, Bob was never, I never met him, I didn't know him. He made millions of dollars as a bond trader in Chicago, but he got very sick, he had a bad heart, in fact, even with all of his uh, wealth, he couldn't buy a heart. Think about that. 
So they put a mechanical heart in him and ultimately it, it failed. And uh, he died uh, in 1999 before I had the privilege of meeting him. And, uh, but he walked these grounds and uh, he loved the Lord. And uh, at some point uh, he carved uh, in this uh, little stump here, he carved his name, Bob, and uh, he carved uh, the year uh, 1998. Uh, it's okay, Jack. And uh, I come and look at this a lot. When all the construction was going on here, I told uh, the construction workers there was actually yellow tape all around this. And uh, I told them, do not touch this. Do not. This, to me, this is all that is left of uh, Bob Van Campen's presence on this property. He lived his life. He made an impact. He loved the Lord. He wrote books about uh, end times, but his life is over. And uh, all that he built, God knows his building, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. This is the only thing that's left uh, on this whole property uh, that would let us know that he was here. Life is so short and so fleeting. My grandmother used to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And in a very short time, I'll be gone, you'll be gone. We're all headed for that one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. So I hope you're thinking and praying about the way that you're building and that you're serving the Lord faithfully with the right attitude and for the right reasons. If that's true, you're going to receive a reward. The fire will test your work and it will remain and you will receive a reward from Jesus Christ. So let's build on the foundation of Jesus Christ in a way that pleases and honors him.